Alrighty, so we're going to get right into it, and what I want to do is I want to take the time to basically just kind of sit down and just kind of go over from a top-down standpoint what we're going to be doing over the next couple of months, uh, what's being released today from experimental to public. Uh, so right off the bat, what's coming to public branch today? Um, there was a huge push to get civilian evacuation more fleshed out to provide a new way of playing the game uh, for people that just wanted to basically more push like evacuation heavy play style. So we caved and we basically spent a good amount of time over the last one or two months cleaning up the systems, working with the community on Discord and essentially just kind of going back and forth, back and forth and having in-depth meetings on our Discord, sharing our screen, listening to what people had to say and making adjustments as needed. So what we settled on was this quick little bullet point that I'm just going to hit down and then we're going to get right into what's coming up in the summer. So we added a new civilian hold that was 250 slots. That is quite large, but it will two of them will be able to facilitate the maximum amount of civilians that you can ever evacuate in one zone. We added smaller evac pads that were basically small little green uh, market flares that the that you could build from the admin center, civilian admin center, that were cheaper and allowed you to essentially just kind of like have urban evacuations more seamlessly. We added five by two cages, which allows up to ten uh, uh, civilians that you could eventually you could uh, farm DNA from. So if they're infected and you're evacuating from nearby provinces. You can uh, use the DNA scanners via the ROE intake options to effectively send infected people to these cages and then use them to farm DNA for shutter rounds and long term for the DNA research tree that we're going to be adding. Uh, we're going to be sneaking in the single cages again back in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we added a bus system. And that was pushed previously, but the bus system got a lot of tweaks, a lot of improvements, and a lot of bug fixes over the last couple of weeks. We added a double Chinook system to where all helipads have two Chinooks that are paired to them. And the idea is that they're always switching out. So when one's going to the carrier, one's going to the, to the helipad, and vice versa. So then that way you're able to increase your output by double when it comes to the civilian evacuations. Uh, we did a major push for gas across the whole spectrum of ground, ground vehicles to just make them more feasible for long-term operations. We'll look at that again when we add San Francisco North. Just make sure that the usability is there. Um, we added uh, a 3D zone text that can be toggled on and off via keybind or going into the gear option on the lot bottom left by doctrines, going to visual options, and then toggling it on and off. You can also go into the gameplay options, and you can set the height at which it starts to render so everyone's happy. And it allows you to basically really, really quickly get insight into a zone, set up evacuation rules. You could use the eyedropper tool to amass set evacuations. So that instead of like going to each zone and clicking on it and remembering, you could click on the zone that you're evacuating to, click on the eyedropper, and then link all those zones to that zone. And you can use it to transfer populations away from conflict zones if you want to minimize civilian casualties to move them away from front lines. You could use them to uh, basically like move vast amounts of people from province to to, the, to your evacuation zones. Um, and the buses will work with those systems because the buses will effectively allow you to um, move vast quantities of people, up to 128 people per bus. So the idea behind it is that you build these bus depots across the whole world, and the first thing they do is they check the rules of their home zone. And they'll follow whatever the rules are in that zone. But if their home zone doesn't have anyone to evacuate or there are nothing set for them, then they'll start to go to other zones that are close to them and start to basically follow those zones' rules. So now you don't have to babysit these buses. You can build two to three in this zone, two to three in this zone, two to three in this zone, up to a max of 12. 
globally, and they will automatically just find zones nearby and evacuate and do their job. And for efficiency's sake, if you want to go back and delete them and move them closer, so that way they don't have to like you know go back to their home bus station too often, you could do that to speed up their efficiency. So that was a big push that we did going into what's coming on the public branch. Another big push was global lighting. I think that someone posted it on our public Discord of like some lighting in other games. We were looking at Spider-Man on PS4 and PS5. We were like, shit, our lighting sucks. So we are like, okay, let's see if we can figure out something. And we spent the time r&d and just kind of playing with the lighting settings and trying to come up with a combination of settings that would not nuke people's computers for their gpu costs but at the same time provide ambient world lighting from what we found out and the recent optimizations to the render and the engine and how it's changed over time we were able to not only add ambient lighting to the city as a whole that turns on at nighttime add on emissive lighting to the buildings, but we were also able to remove all lighting restrictions on the spotlights, and we were able to add a new radial 360 light for your bases. So the idea is, is you use the spotlights facing out towards your perimeters, and you use the radial ambient lights that we've built, that we've added to the, engin the engineer's buildable list for the interior of your bases, they just provide illumination. They turn on and off at nighttime and daytime, respectively. Um, and we even added in new gameplay options for people that are on lower end hardware to where they can limit the range at which lights will turn on and off. So if you're on like a 1600, 16, 10, 10, 10, 10,000 generation NVIDIA card or a 2000 NVIDIA card and you don't want to compromise on the frame rate, you don't want to see as much ambient lighting when you zoom out you want more frames you can tweak that slider that we added in the gameplay options it is the best of both worlds because then you can just kind of tweak it and find it to your heart's content and the same thing we also made the auto graphics configuration tool a lot more um, strict in terms of how it configures like your video options and your just your options across the board some of it it just doesn't configure and it comes down to just you just playing the game because it's every computer is different um but a lot of it will be auto configured and we increase the 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 requirements for some of those things they just generally be able to kind of like be a little more like uh, aggressive so that you people can get more frame rate on lower spec to medium spec computers. And then if you want to compromise and you want more visual fidelity, then you could just override the settings from the baseline values that it will auto configure and go from there. Um, we um, we did hundreds of bug fixes. We did tons of performance tweaks i mean i was just playing the build on our minimum spec and comparing it to basically like before and after the experimental and i was noticing at least a 40 to 50 percent in performance boost so that's a huge amount uh where people were reporting they could play it on their legion goes and their steam decks more reliably now you're still going to notice that if you're on a minimum spec computer and you zoom all the way out you're still going to get some frame rate dips. And we'll work on that. We'll keep tweaking that. And we'll keep trying to push that as far as we can. Because there's still a lot more work we can put into the game to just get more range out of the performance. But I feel like we're going to just keep tiptoeing and keep just kind of pushing the line until we finish 1.3. And that's the major line items that, like, before co-op, we have to optimize and just... Oh, we have to optimize the holy hell out of the game. So that's going to be the point where like, we're going to be trying to squeeze every bit of performance out going into the end of the year to just make sure everyone is performant and people are able to play it. The people that are on lower spec computers maybe won't look the best, but it will operate. And it'll be as bugless an experience as you know we can obviously just keep pushing. Uh, please keep reporting bugs. Please keep reaching out to us of the issues that you're running into uh, because that helps us a ton because you figure everyone plays the game differently. So there are some combinations of things that we just we don't even think of.
in terms of basically like do this, do that, then this breaks. So that's a great when you guys are vocal and you're able to basically involve us in the process of like whatever's going wrong in your play sessions. Now, what's coming up next? And that's the big question on everyone's mind. Because you figure we've been teasing vehicles, we've been teasing like, you know, all this stuff since November of last year. And even before that, you know, it's been like, when is the Abrams coming? When is the MRS coming? When is the Bradley coming? When are you guys adding weapons to the helicopters? You know, like those kind of things. Those are all coming. Those are our next line items. Like all of our attention to detail, all of our resources are being pushed into the vehicles. Coming Like after this video is post, posted, We've already updated our engine to 5.4. We've already started to experiment and get the next build out on experimental by just making sure that everything's working. And then once we make sure everything's working and nothing's broken and we get 5.4 engine update, it's immediately going to be chaos vehicles. So I want to take the time to just kind of explain why 5.4 is so important and why we had to switch to it. Um, right off the bat, just going off of this list, you have things like motion matching that allows Michael and other animators that we might get in the future a lot more ability to just kind of feed an animation like repository to the engine and then it's able to basically dynamically blend and uh, make more realistic movements based off of the more animations you feed the system, the more realistic and more and the more seamless the transitions will appear based off of my understanding and that's something we're going to be learning and implementing going into working on the circuit doctrines card is michael's going to be working on making the animations look even better feeding it more mocap animations from our our libraries and from other people's libraries that we buy online to basically just kind of flesh out the dynamics of movement um, there's tons of nanite optimizations, so they're always improving and making the renderer more effective, more efficient. Um, you know, things like TSR for upscaling is something that we're going to be able to, like, in the future, we're going to push so you can change your anti-aliasing method in the engine real time based off of, like, what, how do you want to compromise? How do you want things rendered in the engine? That's something we're going to be pushing. There was a huge push from them benchmarking the Matrix demo on consoles and on PC to lower a GPU cost across the board. So that's something that we're going to be looking into. And theoretically, we don't have to do anything, and it's just a matter of us just updating the engine, and we gain those benefits of uh, an approved GPU uh, optimizations. So that's something we're going to be testing for. We gain a lot of improvements to LWC which is basically large world coordinates. What that allows us to do is effectively have larger worlds with improved precision in terms of like an older build before 5.0. There were a lot of issues when it came to like, once your map got too large, object, there'd be offsets, there'd be inaccuracies. Things would start to like go off the rails because the engine did not support really large worlds. And that's been a big push for Unreal Engine 5 and in going into like each version. And they've been improving their tech for increasing the size. And as you guys know, our map is only getting larger. So it's one of those things where like as they scale up and invest in their tech, we're able to take that that they use for Lego Fortnite, for Fortnite, and all the other developers that are giving them feedback, and then we can bake that into our game and improve our game as the engine gets better and better. Um, Chaos Destruction is now finally production ready. And that's one of the biggest things that we've been waiting for before we do the vehicles, is we've wanted to make sure that, like, hey, look, they've battle tested it, they've had it on Fortnite, other developers have used it, it's been live in multiple ecosystems over different architectures, so at that point, it's stable. So we're not going to have to deal with early accessing that component and then have to deal with fixes that we can't fix because it ha Epic Games is the only one that can fix it. So it's one of those things where it's like, Okay, they've battle tested it. Now we can build that as a fundamental layer of terms of how the vehicles traverse and move. Now we can have airstrikes and grenades and other effects that could destroy concrete walls, wood fences, uh, move and push cars around. So we can start to bake that 
into the gameplay. Now, we're not talking, well, we're not going to be destroying buildings. I'm going to be right off the bat, is that we're, our, the engine is not going to do that well, supporting total building destruction. We're talking about surface layer destruction, keeping it grounded. Nothing like uh, Iron Harvest or whatever, the, the other RTS game. It's going to be more so street lights, poles, uh, fences, uh, things that basically like the juggernaut can, you know, Kool-Aid Man smash through walls. Your Bradleys and your tanks can drive through concrete walls and, you know, move stuff around. So it's going to introduce a new level of uh, dynamic gameplay in terms of things that were static, like that park in the center of Treasure Island. You just build a wall. You're fine. Just, the Juggernaut's gonna come, not going to come through that fence. Uh, you know, you don't have to worry about someone firing an RPG and it missing. Instead of hitting your tank on the other side of the fence, it hits the fence, and now that's open. And now Infected can channel through. Now uh, anarchists or other groups can come through and attack you because now they've opened up a whole new front. So it's something that we're really, really like excited about pushing in terms of like getting that as a fundamental layer of vehicle traversal and having it to where the vehicles understand that you can go through these objects and they're going to slow you down a little bit or you can go around. So that's something we're going to be experimenting with. I think we're going to be playing with the idea of double click means haul ass. We don't care what you have to click go through. Just get to that destination. And a single click is going to be just basically respect the nav, don't go through stuff. And I think that's the direction we're going to go in. We're going to, we're going to experimental uh, dev off that. We're going to put it on experimental. We're going to test it. We're going to get y'all's feedback. And then we'll alliterate based off of just play testing it as we play it and as you guys play it. Because as you guys know, you know, ideas that sound good on paper don't always translate well to gameplay. So we're always like very fluid in terms of like adapting and adjusting as needed based off of how things play out on our spectrum and how they play out from a community spectrum of like how are they working so what i want to do is i want to kind of break down what can be expected when it comes down to chaos vehicles or just generally if we don't go all in on chaos vehicles and we do a fake simulated one so we have more control but it fakes the movement and the fluidity, what is that going to look like? What are we going to be, you know, uh, pushing out in terms of a feature standpoint? So right off the bat, the biggest thing is you want to have infantry slots. So what, the, what does this mean? Infantry slots, based off of me playing the game, other people playing the game, me sitting in AMAs and talking to people in the community, is it's really frustrating to basically have infantry and vehicles, issue them a move order, and the vehicles take off the fucking uh, like 2, and then your infantry are stuck walking or running, and they can't keep up. So the first layer is having it to where if you issue a move order with vehicles and infantry, every vehicle will have points. Like, we'll say six to nine points per vehicle, where the infantry will fall in and guard that vehicle. The Bradley, the the Hummers, the, the Abrams, they'll all have points that they'll just lock in, and they'll stay in step sync with the vehicle. And the vehicle will slow down to the slowest movement speed. Everyone in the formation. So if you issue 12, in 12 infantry with three vehicles... Those 12 infantry will file and rake around the vehicles in the front. And then if they run out of slots, they'll automatically fall into a column behind the last vehicle in the formation. And everyone, the vehicles and the infantry, will move at the same speed. And the idea behind that is that, that way you'll get less clipping. Things will be more efficient in terms of like if a spitter spits at you and there's an AOE attack. There's a lot more like spacing, so you don't have to sit there and micro the game as much in terms of like the combat encounters. You do an attack move, you do a normal move, they'll stay in that formation. Now, once you start individually selecting units and telling them to move around, they'll break that formation, obviously. So it's you get the control that you're looking for based off of like you know the pros and cons of what we've seen in terms of like what we've kind of pushed out already. And 
you figure the max movement speed is a huge change. We've heard it over and over again, talking to people in the community. And I agree with them in terms of like the company heroes approach of everyone just fuck all, just going in at their own, like cars go real fast, infantry go real fast. It's not going to really work out that well based off of just, we need everyone to stay together. Especially when we introduce and balance out more of the of the dynamic civilian groups and other people having guns, is that we need to have some semblance of a formation and a group moving together as a cohesive unit. Um, and then having vehicles where if it's only a unit selection, they'll have maybe a couple of basic formations for ground vehicles. We're thinking one to two ground formations at most because of the object density in our world. We're not going to go that crazy in terms of having like five, six formations for the vehicles because of their size. Then odds are they're not even going to be able to keep those formations. So we'll do like column. We'll do like two by two column. We'll do like a single file. I think that's going to be it for the vehicles. Maybe we do wedge. I don't know. Based off of like the object density of the vehicles and the, and the traffic and the congestion, it's going to make it more cumbersome in terms of basically the city, or it's an urban jungle. So it's one of those things where like, where that's what we're thinking right off the bat. Um, we're thinking about dynamic, uh, rampant up and down of vehicles. So then that way, if you issue a move order with vehicles, they'll check the speed of other units next to them, and they'll try and speed up or, sleep, or slow down. So then that way they stay in their pre-designated position if it's just an only vehicle movement order. So then that way you don't get vehicles like right inside of each other. Like you don't get vehicles that like take a turn and someone else is so close and they're right in their butt. So that's something we're gonna be looking into. Um, obviously we're gonna be looking into basically further tweaks of the formation system so they have a better understanding of the world and how to traverse and how to move. Um, the, the big kahunas. We're gonna, you know, we're gonna be putting in the Abrams. We're gonna be putting in the MRS. We're gonna be putting in the Bradley. And the Abrams is going to be our first test in having armor kits and having uh, passive abilities that can intercept RPGs, passive abilities that can intercept projectiles that are coming towards it via an active denial system. Kind of like the stuff they have in Battlefield where like a missile will shoot out and it'll counteract or you can just go uh, reactive armor, that kind of stuff. So we're going to be experimenting with those kits. And if it goes well and it plays well, then we'll roll it out to the striker. We'll roll it out to the Bradley. You know, we'll just kind of go from there. Then the last, well, not the last thing, rather, but the next thing is the DNA Atlas. So we've heard people's feedback. It's like they want more ways of farming DNA. Not everyone wants to just run around and play uh, Find Waldo with the scientists of finding DNA. So it'll be done in moderation where it's like if you want to run around and grab all the DNA, you can with the scientists. Otherwise, you have the way of farming DNA by evacuating people from infected zones, too. The third way is going to be this DNA farming atlas where you set up a mobile research center in yellow, red, or maybe early green zones. And based off of those three, you will be able to get a tick of DNA that that facility is generating. But there's a counter. You are now a flagged target who all infected in that zone and adjacent zones. So now it's going to start a dynamic mission for, say, a horde mission where Chelsea and her lieutenants are going to throw everything they can at you to get you to back off, to, start, to stop farming, to stop trying to research and understand the virus. So now it becomes like this, uh, you know, like, are you going to risk staying there too long? Does the zone gets more infected and build up a larger quantity? Are you just going to take little bites off the chunk and not and minimize your risk? You know, because like, theoretically you could move a, one of these babies in there, build an outpost, and then just start farming. Or you could just send in a contingent of units and build some sandbags, build some barbed wire, bring some mobile atlases with the guard uh, tower upgrades, and just provide operational security, and then have a Chinook nearby. And that Chinook could just be ready to just evacuate that uh, atlas at a moment's notice. Because the idea is that it's risk as a reward. If you stay in there too long, you have to be able to get that atlas back to your medical facility, because that atlas is going to be built only from the medical facility. And the idea is that you have to come back and deposit that DNA at that facility. So if you, 
you know, lo- if it gets destroyed, you lose all the you do lose all that DNA. You know, so it's like, how long can you guarantee that 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 uh, vehicle's survivability, its life in that conflict zone? And if you go into a red zone, you best be prepared or prepare to defend it from leviathans, from birds, from uh, juggernauts, from bluff guys. Spinners are all going to descend on you like a locust. So the idea is that it's very risk versus reward. You have to know your limitations in terms of how, what you're going to be able to take and when you have to pull, you know, pull out. So I think that's going to provide a lot of interesting gameplay opportunities uh, when we when we present that. Um, then going down the bat, we're going to be adding an infantry mortar for the engineer. We're going to be adding a volcano mine deployment system. Kind of like the, I think the South Koreans use it, where basically it's a atlas or like a transport truck that will allow you to mark a zone and then it will automatically keep that field saturated with mines, friend or foe system. So they won't detonate on your units, but they will detonate on the enemy. We'll be getting rid of individual mine placement from the engineer. We'll be giving that to the sniper via a claymore system. Um, so after we wrap up that vehicle area, we get the driving good. We do a couple of experimentals where we're going to give you guys a test track. So on experimental, you'll get like a new button. It'll say like test track. And it'll be like a dev map where you guys can go in and give us feedback of how do you feel the driving works? How does the combat feel? Spawn some debug enemies with us. You know, test it with us. Give us real quick feedback. And then at that point... We roll it out to the, the the we roll it out to one uh, wheeled vehicle, the Ajax, and one uh, the track vehicle via the Abrams. And then once we're happy with those two samples, we roll it out and we convert all the other vehicles. Um, and then from there we start airborne because we know people have wanted us to basically focus on the airborne assets for a long time in terms of. Just right off the bat, it's going to be them supporting very basic formations, maybe two to three for airborne assets. And then it's going to be them favoring higher heights and verticality when the move orders are further away and favoring lower heights when the move orders are closer. Um, supporting basic vehicle simulation physics. So like you'll see the actual helicopter traverse and move to a basic degree in local space instead of like this the abstract static movement. Because when we put it in there, it's kind of like a proof of concept, but now we need to alliterate on it. Now we need to improve it. Now we need to make the visuals look better. We've gotten some flack over that over the years, but it's one of those things where I was like, we kind of just need to see if we could do it kind of prototype it and then then keep tweaking it as we go, as we have the time and the resources. Um, Another big thing is having directional weapons and free-firing weapons. A free-firing would be like the Apache's uh, gun under its base, where it can shoot independent of the direction that the helicopter is facing. And then you have the directional weapons, like the little bird, gaining like, you know, the little, it's gaining like uh, miniguns, it's gaining rocket pods. So then at that point, you know, those are directional weapons where they're based off of, like, the little bird understanding how to face its target and fire. And being able to use these as weapon packages to provide uh, some gunning runs, support runs, and then pull back, get, re- get ammo, and then come back and do it again. Black Hawk Down style, basically. Um, then the, obviously, the other no- what big one is working on the traversal for the little birds for the black hawk for you know the VTOL where essentially the Sharon where or the, sorry, wait, is basically so where it can not overshoot its destination because the repelling overshoots destinations we need to fix that and then the uh, just move orders overshoot destinations they need to be quick and responsive and understand they need to ramp down their speed as they get closer and closer to the destination, so they don't overshoot and they're more accurate. Uh, the VTOL, I mentioned that briefly, that's a new unit coming in. It's going to have a weapon package. Um, and then the Little Bird, the Black Hawk, those are gaining weapon packages that you're going to be able to upgrade, where they're going to be more inspired off of like prototype, or they're going to be like uh, like little arms. Like in, uh, where you basically add weapons that can shoot directionally. We're not doing door gunners at this time based off of just overhead and animation. 
everything is going to be based off of like the GTA approach or prototype approach, where you, or like uh, just cause where you have basically the little like arms that little add-ons that you put, and then it's rocket pods or missile pods that shoot directionally in front. Um, and then the Apache will be getting a buff. We'll be looking at the Apache because that's going to be considered a super weapon with the MRS, with the Abrams, with the Bradley, the three pillars of Cirque, basically, is that we're going to want to look at the Ab Apache, we're going to look at the vehicles, give them some abilities here and there to kind of flesh them out, and then add the ability to turn on and off auto firing of super weapons, like the rockets. So you can right click it to toggle a path, like an MMO almost. You can right click the ability. And it will effectively lock, it'll, it'll toggle it to auto fire or fire missiles. Or you can left click it and it'll be a single fire uh, uh, ability. Like in an MMO where it'd be like, okay, I want to fire a rocket barrage into this area. You know, and then it would use the preset rockets that are on that allocation of how many you can fire or whatever. So that's going to be something we're going to be testing and prototyping going into the summer. Um, I, I said, after we get all the airborne stuff situated, maybe we get to the point of my wish list items of a Predator drone and Harriers on the aircraft carrier. That's more of like, if we knock all this out of the park, if we get ahead, I want to add Harriers. I want to add a Predator drone that you can build from the aircraft carrier. There's a reason why there's a second floor deck and there's an elevator. The idea was that we were going to have that in some shape, time, and form where you could deploy air assets from that aircraft carrier. But that's long term. I don't know if we're going to fit it in now or we're going to fit it in later, but it's on my wish list. Um, then there's the auxiliary list. So the auxiliary list are things that basically fall outside of the mechanized units. They're things that we want to just give some pizzazz and some polish. So there are things like the airstrike packages. Like the way that you call an airstrikes right now are very crude. They worked since 2020 since our prototype stages, but Broken Arrow, other games have better ways. Uh, even uh, games from 10 years ago, like uh, World of Conflict, have better ways of calling it airstrikes in our game. So it's one of those things where we're going to be looking across the spectrum and coming up with better positional airstrike ones and uh, like, you know, like shaped ones and custom ones where you can have better tactical control over these airstrikes that you have already in, and then adding in new ones. Because every single airstrike in the game has been redone. We've been sitting on them for months, I think at this point six months, until the time that we could focus all of our effort in basically just getting them out. And I'll have some videos up for everything that we're talking about as we're going through these things to kind of demonstrate what I'm talking about. But it's going to be like an actual A-10 strafing run, an actual A-10 bombing run, you know, having a better model that comes in, you know, having a better AC-130, a dragon gun ship that comes in that actually has its turrets rotating. Yes, we're going to be adding it so you can control the AC-130. So you set an arc, a circle, and then you can press a button and you'll be able to jump up to that AC-130 and provide your own operational fire support. And your units will have ID strobes like Call of Duty 4 so you can identify friend or foe and shoot yourself and zoom in yourself and use the three tiers of cannons yourself. That's something I've wanted to do for so goddamn long. But now, and finally, well, now that we're able to kind of like Focus on circuit. Get all this situated. We're going to get in everything that I've always wanted to get in on the game. Like these airstrike packages. Whether they be direct control like the Dragon Gun ship. Or just better precision and better ways of calling in the airstrikes and better visuals. Um, we're going to be adding in, uh, I think they're technically tier 4 walls. Battlements. From the aircraft carrier, we were able to figure out a way of doing movement that was like... Um, I guess you could say, like, we are able to R&D ways of doing things off the navigation mesh that still work pretty goddamn well. So one thing we're going to be trying to push in there is uh, battlements where you can have units on your walls. And then I don't know if we're going to be able to fit this. This is on my wish list as well, is shipping containers, shipping container doors. Like in the, um, the casino... Uh, Zack Snyder's zombie movie, because it's something I've wanted to add for so bloody long, is those kind of walls where you can't shoot through them. You don't get line of sight, but they're they take so much more damage. So those are for like those are for like heavy conflict zones 
where it's basically like you're building in a red zone, you're building in a yellow zone, you're going to be under constant attack. And basically those shipping containers would have like double the durability of a normal tier three wall, but you can't shoot over them. And you have to go outside and lead teams to basically clear the sides of your perimeter or use helicopters or use little birds to strengthen it. But it would be like near destructible walls. Um, beyond that, it's, we're going to be re-adding the scout car. And we're going to be adding Marines, basically, that drop in with that scout car, or some kind of armored combatant unit group, uh, as a test bed to see how all that works. Kind of like company here is when you call in, like, uh, a pre-assortment of pre-assortment uh, units. But each one will be individually controlled, like our normal system. But it'll be a vehicle and units that are pre-garrisoned that will drop in via a parachute and they're ready to go. They're ready to fight. And it'll be our first test bed for trying to see how well we can get that working for like company of heroes, like anti-tank squads or ranger squads, where it's like they're a pre-assortment of units you can call in. They're ready to go. They're ready to fight. You don't have to like order them from the barracks or the motor pool, garrison them and put them in there. Um, something I've wanted to test for a long time. So something we're going to be trying out with just like a test bed. Um, and then we're going to be doing a audit on non-mechanized units. So what does non-mechanized units mean? That means things like the assault, the heavy, the sniper, the engineer, you know, where essentially we're going to be pushing them um, towards finalization of having more purpose in gameplay. So an example would be is classes will gain access, certain classes will gain access to smoke grenades, flash grenades, frag grenades, incendiary grenades. And that will be based off of their predefined role in the combat of the game. Classes will be audited. Snipers will gain claymores. Heavies will gain deployment emplacements to be able to lock down positions and have like preset sandbags that come up that could basically they could break down and set up. Um, engineers will gain minions like turrets so they can put down like aliens, like the aliens movie, where it's like those little deployable throwaway quick turrets. So the quick the, the current turrets that are building are going to become that, and then the turrets that we have that are buildable will become will become larger, taller emplacements that you basically put in the game. Um, and that's a quick drive-by. There's going to be more than we do, but I'll announce more for non-mechanized like units when we get to that point in about a couple months. Then after that, we've heard a lot of feedback about the UI cards. People want more color. They want more vibrance. They like the old approach that we had over the new approach of just kind of sterile and monotone. And we looked at StarCraft, we looked at a lot of games, and they were, we were noticed that everything always did the monotone approach, like Broken Arrow and everything else. So we were like, okay, that just must be what people want. So we ended up just kind of using them as like uh, feedback or, I guess, influence, but then people didn't like it. So a lot of people were very vocal that they wanted the colors, they wanted the vibrance, they wanted things to stand out more for the command window at the bottom right, for the airstrikes. So it's something that we're going to dedicate you know, a week or so, two weeks to work with the community on Discord, on Steam, if people are posting, and basically just flesh that out more and get more colors and get our UX artists in there again to basically just kind of get that to where it needs to be. Um, then after that, we're going to be hitting on the DNA research stream. This is something that I've just kind of biding my time to get to. And one of the biggest things was basically getting it to where they would provide... They provide incremental upgrades to Cirque's effectiveness in the field. So I'll give you a couple of examples. I'm going to leave the rest for like when we actually release an experimental because things are going to change between now and then. And the idea is a couple of them that we've already programmed in there. We're just waiting for the UI so we get to that point of testing it. Is having better resistances to say spitter acid for some units. Uh, having longer oxygen tanks, more efficient oxygen tanks for when units like the scientists or like the normal units go into gas and contagion zones, doubling or tripling the number based off of the tier that you've researched. Uh, having an actual progression tree for shutter rounds, where the idea would be is that you don't go for Chelsea directly, you dismantle her lieutenants, you kill them, you, you collect their corpses, when they die, and they can use that as stepping stones to unlock shredder rounds. So having a more logical progression tree to going after the big baddie. Um, so like each lieutenant would be able to respawn now. 
you know, they'd come, they'd have an area of influence or a base pod. Each, uh, each one holds a piece of the puzzle of unlocking shutter rounds. And it'd be a section of the research tree that is essentially just kind of cordoned off where it's like a logical progression down to get the shredder rounds. And then you'd have, and then you'd have other groupings of the research tree for just improving the resistance or the ability to detect the virus or cure the virus in people, for instance, to save more people. Um, and that's all we're really going to kind of hit upon for the DNA research tree. We'll have more to reveal. We'll put it on an experimental, and we'll basically like have you guys test that after we wrap up the circuit doctrine stuff. And then after that, it's AI revamps. And this is a big one that we've heard over the years of basically the AI attacking your defense logic. So we're going to just basically ask for community saves. Show us your Fort Knoxes. Show us your best bases. You know, when we get to that point. And then we're going to just deconstruct it from a standpoint of how would an AI prod, how would it, how would an infection prod and attack this base logically? How do they dismantle it? How do they get you to spit your units and make them more intelligent? So we're going to just be basically just crowdsourcing for just vast quality of different bases, bases that we make, bases the communities make, and just kind of giving their attack and defense logic a facelift, but at the same time making sure that they're fair and they're not cheating. So that's going to be the AI revamp. And then the and then the LT revamp is going to be basically, you know, having it to where there's another line item on our roadmap. Is having it to where each lieutenant gets offshoot mutations, to where like as I mentioned previously in a DNA research tree that we're going to be doing, um, each lieutenant is going to gain an area of influence. An example would be Division Warlords of New York. Well, if you zoom out, each one of Agent Keener's people would have. An area where they'd be, you'd see their icon, you'd see their area expanding when well, they didn't expand that game. But in our game, they're going to expand based off of their forces pushing fronts against you, against factions, against dynamic civilian groups. And the idea is that in each area of influence, you must locate the lieutenant, you must uh, adapt and counter to each area's mutations. I'll give a couple of examples. Uh, for instance, the Fenrir operative, which is the female operator that uh, is infected, will gain the ability, she'll cloak. She'll have offshoot infected that are more towards stealth and ambushing. So when you're in her zones, she'll use standard infected to prod, but her bigger boys will all be geared towards like getting behind you, flanking, coordinated attacks. Uh, cloaking, so you have to employ like scouts to decloak units, um, tax sensors, things that basically you bring into the field to decloak, and to basically be able to identify targets quicker. Um, an example would be another one of the lieutenants is Dr. Noah Wells from the book, is that he'll be buffing and supporting infected. So his infected, like the blow up guy, instead of like causing as much damage, they'll immobilize and freeze your units in place. So the idea is that basically like each lieutenant will gain an interesting spin in terms of all the infected under their realm of influence. So then that way it adds more variance to gameplay and you have to adapt your strategies as you play. You have to change out your weapons as you go from province to province because you have to be more adaptable. You have to plan things out more. And that's the biggest thing we want to push for the game is having it to where like situations require more preparation. There are going to be situations where you have to retreat. You have to cut your losses. You got to leave them to die if you can't get everyone out. You know, we want to make the game to where there's a lot of hard choices you have to make, whether it be the ethics of saving civilians to, you know, holding out those guys that you just spent so much money on. Uh, and it's just kind of experimenting and kind of playing with it and just kind of making it, like, very difficult. Um, another couple of examples for the LTs is, like, different ones will gain different abilities based off of how they're, on the game design doc, each one has, like, their pros and cons of what they're good and what they're bad at. The same way that the infected mutations will be an echo chamber of that. You know, they'll get fast running. They'll be able to jump higher. They'll be able to cloak. They'll be able to buff infected. They'll be able to insta-kill your units and do execution animations. They'll have AOE abilities. They'll be able to dodge attacks. Like, say, for instance, if a striker shoots at Chelsea, she'll step right out of the round. She it won't even hit her. So you'll have to overwhelm her. You'll have to surround her, and you'll have to outthink her, is the idea. So it'll be more like 
the parallel a prototype almost where it's like whatever black watch was countering mercer it was always overwhelming firepower. It was always, you know, trying to quarter him and get it over, and just basically you know, overwhelm him. Use, use all your tactical assets to just, you know, dismantle him slowly but surely as he's just blowing through your units. And that's the biggest thing we want to, and we want to push for lieutenants is that they are in game boss fights. They are to be feared. They are to be, you know, like you have to prepare yourself. For them, it's not going to just be you stroll in there with a couple of Apaches, you stroll in there with a couple of infantry, and it's just a mop up duty. No, it's going to be a full on boss fight where you're going to lose a lot of people if you're not paying attention to placement, if you're not paying attention to what his rotation of abilities are. You know, it's almost going to be like a Monster Hunter fight, I guess, is the biggest one, or like a, I guess. Prototype, where it's gonna be like you know Alex Mercer's tool set, you know what he can do and what he can't do in games like in that game, so you know like don't let your units get super close because he'll cleave them, you know he can jump up and move if you get him cornered and like you know like for Chelsea for example something we're look we're looking at is like the idea is that Chelsea mirrors kind of Mercer in terms of his tool set where he can cloak not not just say cloak but he can basically camouflage as other people, you know he can move very fast so like. Being able to kind of have the LTs where they have some amount of self-preservation, where if they know they're in a, fighting a losing battle or they're going to die, like Chelsea, something we're going to push for her is having to where she'll just fucking take off running. And she'll run into a civilian mob or run into a crowd and turn into one of them. Which one is she? Are you going to open fire on the whole crowd? Are you just going to start blowing up the whole neighborhood? Because she just slipped the whole battle. That you've been preparing for the last 10 minutes for. So now she's going to regroup, lick her wounds, and come for you with the vengeance. Because the idea is that's part of her LT AI, and that's part of the AI, the AI that we're going to be pushing to just really, really cement them as, like, you know, a challenge, an adversary that's trying to, it's a chess game. Is the idea, and that's the biggest thing that we want to focus on in their entirety for a good period of time, is to just take the time that's needed to basically like get these systems fleshed out. You know, and it's something that we like. I didn't, I didn't really hit upon earlier for the 5.4 is that you know, uh, having it to where the infection growth can grow in the level via the. Um, Procedural content generation they just baked in the 5.3 and 5.4, and then being able to have runtime H lots to optimize those assets to keep them optimally cheap, ideally. So that way, her realms of influence, Lieutenant's realms of influence, will grow and expand. Kind of like an example would be the upside down world from Stranger Things or Prototype, where you enter yellow and red zones, where the atmosphere changes, the infection growth changes. Those are all things that. But during the AI and the LT revamp, we're going to delve into those again with those with the PCG tools and the runtime age lots. And I'll have some of my artists that aren't working on programming, prototyping, and taking all those infected growth systems that we've those assets that we've created over the years and see if we could turn them into like a grass growing system. Where we define rules and we set limitations of how much it can grow for optimization reasons, mind you, and be able to turn this level into an alien hellscape, like State of Decay, like Prototype, you know, like those kind of things where you know that you're entering and that when you're in, you need to enter those, or the Zerg creep, when you enter those areas of influence, your units will gain debuffs, you know, you, you're not you're, you're not fighting on your ground, you're fighting on their ground where they move faster, they know when you touch the creep, so they know you're coming, like stuff like that, they just add more difficulty to the game. And counteract how powerful Circa is going to become at the end of the Circa Doctrines card. Because you figure they're going to have all these tools, all these uh, weapons to their their utility belt. But at the same time, the AI need to level up. They need to kind of be able to match you. And something I didn't really touch upon too much here is that bridges. We know that there's a huge dependency on bridges for Circa. You blow up a bridge, GG, you win. Like, you know, you turn off birds, Leviathan, CG, you win. Like, there's no way they're getting past you. At that point, it's just... Uh, it's a numbers game. Just keep building units and keep sending them over on Blackhawks to you win. So, 
we've heard some suggestions about having the infected be able to build growth on on the bridges to build them. We've heard we're we're kind of like debating right now in terms of the best option. We're gonna make our decision during the AI card for the LT for the L between the L LT and the AI card. We're gonna make a decision what we're gonna do to counter that. It's gonna be fair. We're currently mulling around the idea of having it where the infection can swim. Or climb like or the idea would be is that they'd lose a percent of their swimmers, like in Shogun when they climb walls, when it's a deadly thing. So like they lose like twenty percent, thirty percent of whoever jumps in the water and starts swimming, and they can only come up on certain beaches, like the same way that your LCAC can only mount on certain locations that you know they're defendable locations that you can build guard towers and build walls and keep an eye on or set up patrols if you're a little birds or you're black hawks and just have an early detection system or just strafe them in the water when they're swimming um and be able to essentially just kind of like set up it kind of would my idea is that the swimming would encourage people to set up patrols at their little birds and maintain uh you know like an actual like security network. So that's why I'm of the idea of the swimming. There's also the the bridge thing idea of them having an infection growth thing. And then the last thing I didn't touch on yet is uh, we're going to be adding in the ability, like Left 4 Dead is an example, is for them to climb the buildings. So you're no longer going to be safe on those cars. You're no longer going to be safe on those building rooftops. We're, we, uh, we're going to be basically carrying over some stuff that I prototyped about a year ago or so to essentially have it to where they can just mount the wall and, roar and climb up it. Spitter, standard infected juggernauts will just basically rampage their butts up there. And then, and then when we do that, we will remove all restrictions on building. At that time, you will be able to build your barracks, your circuit structures, anything you want on the buildings. Because I know that's been a common suggestion. People wanted us to remove that, but I was not going to allow that until we can figure out the underlying tech and we can balance it. So once we can balance it and we get the climbing in, then at the same time, we're going to mirror that and how, allow the circuit to repel down buildings. So you won't need little birds or black hawks to get up and down the buildings. You'll be able to just find a mount point, tell your unit to move up there, and they'll shoot a gun up, and then they'll just walk up the roof and deposit themselves at the top. So those are two things that are going to be coming in the AI card, LT card, during that. Because we're kind of grandfathering those two together. They're so closely related to each other that we're going to include them together. Um, and then last but not least is the operator. So from a top-down perspective, this is something that we feel like we need to get in there before co-op. There's been some pushback, some back and forth in terms of basically what people want. I feel like it's important because you figure I want to be able to bring together RTS players and shooters, third-person shooter guys, first-person shooters, and RTS friends that want to play co-op together and be able to basically push different perspectives in the campaign that we can build a framework of, but also like standalone missions because I love Resident Evil. Like who didn't grow up playing Resident Evil 4 and all the other games back in the day? Um, well, something that we were prototyping for a while was CPO so we could learn best practices. And then we were going to originally put that as a standalone, but then we pivoted based off of getting feedback from our community. And basically at the same time, just kind of discussing it amongst ourselves is maybe is more so going into the Call of Duty DMZ route where the idea is it's just going to be a separate game mode. And what CPO is going to be is just a horn missions, uh, time trials, and maybe some set like objective missions. And basically the idea is that you can farm out your operator, his progression and his weapons progression in those modes or in the RTS component, and they all benefit because your heroes are just those. They lead your squads. They're your commanders. They're your avatar to the world. And the idea would be is that you could use them to lead your crack teams and you can upgrade them and specialize them into certain roles that the assaults and the heavies and the snipers will never be. They could be hybrids. They could be specialists. It's whatever you want to do if you're an RPG, like uh, per se, like talent tree system. Kind of reminiscent of Battle for Middle Earth 2's Hero Crater or Rise of the Witch King's Hero Crater. Um, so yeah, so that that is in a nutshell of everything that we're working on right now up to co-op. And then once we get all of that going, and we're, I think we're gonna revisit the operator for co-op. We're gonna kind of get a feel for the community of like, I feel like these are important, like, you know, 
let me let me let me cook. Let me see if I can basically, you know, situate these in time of a month or so, and then go to co-op. So that way, a, you guys are getting a crap ton of more content to play while we're working on co-op. Um, we would use the operator as a test bed uh, to basically streamline and test some of the co-op. So like some some of the modes that I'm going to be showing in the companion footage will be able to be played with your friends in a small fashion while we're working on the higher end higher uh like the higher tier rts aspects of operating the game uh and yeah well that's it so i mean you figure the game has changed a lot you look back at 2020 you look at us now it's different it's a different monster different beast i mean and it's gonna keep changing and it's gonna keep adapting going into the end of the year and then when we're finally happy and we get the co-op out we'll shift gears to the campaign and then we'll probably shut up and be radio quiet so we don't have any spoilers and work on that while you guys are playing the co-op and playing all the other stuff that we've shipped up to that. So that is in a nutshell what everything we're trying to accomplish this year. There's going to be a lot. We're going to need the community's uh, feedback to just be honest with us. Tell us what they like, tell us what they don't like so we can pivot and adjust as needed. Thank you guys so much for the people that play on the experimental um, and basically are willing to just kind of just troop it out day in and day out and work with us like Shaggy, like Terminal, like Lava, like Tarkin, like Chaos. You know, there's so many people on our Discord that are just there every day playing the experimental. Like just like no bullshit telling us what they like and what they don't like. Some of the stuff I can't change right now, but I write it down. I have a notebook. And there is stuff like the evacuation that I swore up and down for two years that we were never going to put it in. We were never going to put civilian evacuation because it wasn't in the scope of our resources. And then we paved. We did it because it made sense as we got more resources and more time. And I thought about it more. And I was like, okay, let me see this from their perspective. What they're trying, what, you know what I mean? Like, let me level with them and see like what we could do. And I did. And now it's fun. I love playing it myself. So it's one of those things where it's like we're always adapting, we're always fluid, we're always trying to basically like see other people's perspectives, write down the notes. And again, because of all that I posted, there's going to be times where I literally cannot take suggestions. I cannot add things in. No matter how good of an idea or suggestion they are right now, based off of just how long that list is that just gone over in this hour-long video. But like there was a guy that tagged me a year later and was like, you listened. You actually like went back and this quote aged like fine wine. And I was like, yeah, I did. I, I put, saved a link in my reports channel on our development discord. I wrote a note in my notepad book and I put it in my sticky notes on Windows 11. And I was like, this is a good idea. I'm going to give it the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to revisit it every couple of months, every every couple of like years, and see, can we do this now? Can we fit this into our schedule? No? Maybe in the future. You know, maybe when the game is done and we're out of early access and we want to basically release a big expansion pack, you know, that, you know, we monetize just to kind of keep supporting development. Maybe it's something we do then. I don't know, because my biggest goal is getting the value proposition of the game out of early access to where it's a slam dunk. It's hard to say no. It's hard not to want to buy the game. You know what I mean? We've done our job, you know, and it's about getting it to that point of justifying the purchase. And then at that point, you know, having 20 hours of content, 30 hours of content easy. And then at that point, we have to justify every single DLC or content pack that we do after that and have good value to them. So it's about getting to that point, getting out of early access, getting you everything we've, we've, we've promised, and then going from there. And I know, I know there's someone in the community right now that's saying, what happened to Pierce? What happened to Natalie? What's going on with the world events? Those are all being earmarked for 1.4 the next big major version. We, we're going to be doing it, like, right after we finish co-op, we're entering 1.4, and then we're going to be working on the factions. I'm going to be splitting up a lot of the revenue that's coming in from the co-op, the increased revenue and the increased influencer uh, viewage, whatever you want to call it, to basically start advocating for more concept art for the factions so we get them fleshed out more, 
expanding the team, bringing on more artists, we can make more assets to flesh out those factions, those sub-factions, and then dedicating the resources to get them first added in the pandemic as an optional flag. You can turn them on and off to play with. And then um, doing things like have, giving them missions, them giving you missions, and being able to assign them tasks, like guarding your zones, you know, uh, stuff like that. So that way it's a give and take. Because that's the, one of the biggest things that I've heard from people for the dynamic civilian groups and for the factions. It's a good system. It's our surface layer. We need to build on it. And I like I like ins, I like inserting systems and then seeing the promise, seeing how it feels, and then fleshing it out over time, and just kind of not going too deep in the weeds sometimes, just so I can kind of play test it and kind of alliterate over time and just see how it feels. Let test it with the community, and then alliterate, you know, as we can. So it's the same thing with dynamic civilian groups. What we bake into them is going to benefit the sub factions because they're going to be a level above the, 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 the dynamic civilian groups. So they're going to be more of a threat, and they're going to work with those groups, or sometimes work against them and eradicate them. So it's something that we're going to be looking into 1.4, and then it's going to be world events like a, a chopper crashes. A VIP was on it. Save him. Extract him. Get money. Uh, world event, you're, in a, you're walking down the street, a bunch of dogs attack you. What are you going to do? Run away? Shoot them? Like that kind of stuff. Like Far Cry 10 second, 20 second dynamic events that you can interact with or avoid. Ignore them altogether just to add more life to the world. Uh, or plane crashes, that kind of stuff. And then obviously the cherry on top is the campaign at the end of 1.4. And then at that point, 1.4 is, by all intents and purposes, will we see the game being as feature complete, and we're on the precipice of leaving early access. And there's a lot on the TBD that we still have to add. So 1.4 is kind of like a barren wasteland if you go on our roadmap. That's going to be dogpiled in with at least a dozen more things from the TBD and from suggestions that you guys have made that are in my notebook, on my reports channel, or suggestions that our developers have that we just don't want to make public yet until we get to that point. And we can basically, you know, expand on it, have concept, have illustrations, and be able, like this, like this infected sperm whale idea, or the guardian for Chelsea. Ideas that we don't have the resources to execute on now. They have concept. Well, we're going to get to them over time as we can, and then as we have the resources. Because we're like five people two programmers, really one and, a, one and a half programmers if you think about it, because I do team management, project management, outreach, community management, PR. So it's one of those things where it's like, my all intents and purposes are typically one programmer. And then I help out when I, like, our daily would need it, you know, and when things are on fire. So it's one of those things where it's like, we're, we are going to keep pushing and doing the best we can, and we thank you guys for your continued patience. We thank you guys for your continued uh, support people like you know that have bought the support packs on steam those really help you know buying the merch on our website i mean i'm wearing it right now the posters like you know the 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 little door little um gaming mats not this one there's another one i have over there you know all that helps for supporting our team because we're self-funded we some of our still work day jobs full-time jobs when we come home work on the game so it's one of those things of just as the project gets larger, we start to transition and wean those people off of those jobs. And at the same time, uh, just be wary of just as things change, like make sure people have other gigs and other stuff they have lined up so they can make sure they're paying the bills. Uh, but it's it's been a hard road. We still have a lot to do. And again, we're, we are above the skies. At it. We're so happy basically of all the support and all the love you guys have given us and that we would not be here without you guys actually giving us the time of day to work with us to give us your feedback to play the game because at the end of the day we just want to make a game you guys love and you enjoy that's not that's what matters at the end of the day and it's taken us a while you know it's been kind of a it's been we've we've, we've made mistakes we're, we're gonna continue, we're gonna make mistakes. You gotta nothing is just clear cut. You're gonna succeed in a day. You have to learn from your failures and just keep keep going, keep working on your craft and learn through those failures and get better at your craft. So again, I just need to wrap it up there. Um, and again, thank you guys so much.